know, uh, don't make fun of people for what they don't know, all right? Everything that everybody knows by the time they're adults, that means that there's 10,000 people in the US hearing about it for the first time every day, right? You just do the math. If you go from never knowing about it to 100% have heard about it by 30, out of 4 million people uh, born per year, it's a 10,000 people who haven't heard of that thing. And of course, as you get more and more particular about uh, DN spy, any dot run was an offhand mention, but a really powerful thing. What is right. any, any dot run? run? I love any run. Yeah. Hand it malware. It'll tell you what it does in their sandbox environment. So let's hunt. Okay. Register, <laughs> upload malware, receive report of what it does. All right. There's a, you can do more in your own SOC and have your own custom environment. But to get started takes registering with an email address. That's not bad. So the example in XKCD is like, what do you mean Diet Coke and Mentos? And many people here have heard of like, oh yeah, Diet Coke and Mentos. You, you put them together and it explodes, it's awesome. Don't make fun of people for things they don't know. Be happy to share the thing that is awesome, right? Come on, we're going to the grocery store. You're one of today's lucky 10,000. And there's gonna be some happy, safe explosions in their future, or so I hope, right? So I want to have a little bit more <laughs> positive, up, uplifting message there. So uh, thank you, uh, Stephen, for that last talk. Um, any last bit before we introduce? Ah, Wesley. Wesley is here. Wesley, do you want to unmute and uh, webcam yourself? Wait, sorry. I said Wesley. I thought I was talking to Matthew. I just went, I derped. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> we do have Juan Spinell here as well. Let me... Uh, that's the live next talk on GDPR and strategies for failure. I'm gonna assume there's like counterparts that are at least heavily implied of strategies for not failure there as well, but that seems pretty likely. Uh, and there we are, Juan, thank you for, for joining. Thank you for a presentation. Ah, all right, so uh, Juan, I'll give you your, your bio real quick before we get you started. Uh, after working as a sysadmin in hospitality, ah, sysadmin background. I, I am completely biased, but I think it's such a great background for so many fields within IT. Uh, at a time where data protection laws were crappy, but growing around the world, I, I added the crappy part, one has been trying to help other IT folks avoid the headaches involved in analyzing basic compliance requirements. A lot of people hear the word compliance and just run away or think, I'm not really responsible for that, so I'm never going to learn anything about it and just ignore it entirely. Um, <laughs> that's at least my bias take. Uh, two years after GDPR went live, we've seen some unforeseen consequences as to how Europeans communicate with the other side of the pond. Where are the other side of the pond? Hi, American <laughs> here. Uh, are, are you on the other other side of the pond? Are you on the European side yourself, Juan? I am on the other other side of the pond. <laughs> where, where are you based out of curiosity? I don't think it said it here. Uh, Switzerland. Switzerland, nice, that's awesome. Um, okay, so two years after GPR went live, unforeseen consequences, how Europeans communicate with the other side of the pond. Hey, other side. Uh, while CVEs and remote shells are all the hype in the InfoSec community, the fines involved with the bad data protection strategies. Hey, uh, what's that headline? What's the maximum fine for GDPR violations? So it's 4% uh, of annual turnover, which, yep. uh, of course, this is not just uh, a one-time fine. This is for every... Uh, breach encountered. So uh, wait, so if you're saying four percent of I, I usually hear it phrases four percent up of global revenue, not profit. Oh my goodness, that's a headline. Like there's teeth to this <laughs> compliance. It has a chance. It gets you to sit up and pay attention because it can have some serious consequences, which is beyond what many compliance frameworks have in place. Uh, the fines involved at bad data protection strategies are the tools that can cripple a company beyond repair. That gets executives to sit up and pay attention, as it should. Yeah. According to McKenzie, Juan can provide the first GDPR talk. I made it to the end without dying 13 times. That is one hell of an endorsement. Was Dave McKenzie your uh, mentor for this on this side? Or? Uh, no, so Dave McKenzie was doing mentoring for the uh, BeerCon 2. Okay. Excellent. All right. Um, I will give you the powers of presenter mode. Poof. You are now prompted to share your screen. 
uh, whenever you are ready, unless there's a little bit of banter you want to do ahead of time, uh, we're exactly on time for you starting as well, which works out well. So you have your full 30 minutes allocated, plus we have 15 minutes of wiggle room for Q&A, so do not panic if you're at the last minute. You don't have to, to rush. Anything else before you go uh, ahead just, and start things away? Yeah, I just want to make sure you guys can see the screen. Yep, yep. 2020 bingo applied. We can see your screen. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, let me uh, just we'll minimize the window. Then. And yeah, we're seeing the right one as well. So nice backdrop. Okay. So. Yep. All uh, yours. Hello. And best of luck. Thank you very much. All right. Um, hello, my name is Juan, and today I'm going to be talking to you today about GDPR and strategies in compliance, or rather, some strategies for failure. Now. Uh, GDPR came around in 2018. It's a set of laws that define how companies need to protect um, consumer data, as well as defining what they are allowed to do or what they're not allowed to do and with which restrictions. It has had some unforeseen consequences. Everyone remembers all the this website uses cookies banner that popped up. Not sure to what extent that happened in the US. Uh, in Europe, we're also seeing lots of websites suddenly saying uh, this content is banned or not available to you because uh, GDPR. So, as I mentioned, GDPR is a text of law. And the main issue of this is that, of course, the people implementing the controls for how the data moves are technical people. But because it's a text of law, it's open to interpretation at some points, uh, most specifically. GDPR constantly mentions the use of state-of-the-art infrastructure when talking about uh, security. So as IT people would take that as saying, okay, you just need to buy more blinky boxes and then you're fine. Of course, we all know that that doesn't provide any additional security. And these are sort of some elements which make it difficult to see eye to eye between the people applying the law and the people trying to keep the companies afloat. GDPR, as I mentioned, uh, protects citizens of the European Union, visitors to the European Union, and companies who wish to target these demographics as key uh, markets uh, need to be compliant with this. That means your local corner store does not have to be GDPR compliant. If, on the other hand, you're a big uh, chain of hotels trying to get European tourists, you do need to make sure about this compliance. I do come from the services industry, which means I'm not focusing here on data portability. Uh, you wouldn't go to a restaurant to request your data, so you can go down to the restaurant closer to yours and have them take it. From the services industry perspective, I think these are the rights which are most critical to ensure that you're respecting. The right to be forgotten, this means that your clients can come and say, I don't want my name to be associated here anymore. The data needs to be either deleted or anonymized. There is the caveat that all financial transactions are immutable because money laundering, tax evasion, but these records can't be processed or accessed aside from those purposes. The right of correction, if uh, for any reason you need to change your name, email address, phone number, how companies can contact you, or of course, any data on the public internet which misrepresents you, you can enforce these changes under GDPR. You can't go to a restaurant two weeks down the line and say, hey, uh, I paid here $15, I only wanted to pay 10. That's not quite the same. You have the right of ownership to data Point, or any data point that links back to you. If you go to the bar, assuming bars are still open, and you pay for your drinks in cash, the transaction is anonymous. It's uh, not owned by you or anyone else aside from the uh, company managing the bar. If on the other hand, you go to a hotel, you have a reservation, which links back to you by name, email, phone number. In the evening, you go to the restaurant, have a meal, 
have it charged to your room. You're creating a transaction which links back to your reservation. You then go to the bar, grab a couple beers, once more, charge that to your room. Again, transaction linked back to your reservation, links back to you through name, phone, email. Because these data points or these transactions link back to you, they are technically your ownership or you can control how these are used. Had you pay directly with a credit card or in cash, the transaction would not link back directly to you or it would be more difficult for the property to link these to you. And so you have less control over this. Finally, because this data points are yours, you have the right to restrict the access to and the processing of this information. This is uh, specific for uh, all information that you're providing the property or the business is to be used within your business transactions. You go to a hotel, you give your name, passport, because they need to provide this to authorities and they're providing you with the room. That doesn't mean that they're then free to contact you every week telling you of the new menu. This also means that they can't just take all your details and send them off to different company for saying, hey, uh, taxi companies to suddenly start emailing you about uh, offers for rides to the airport on the next day. If you're able to cover these five rights as a start for your compliance, it's a good start for your strategy. Now, if you're trying to build up your own strategy, think about where the data is going if it were yours. Would you be happy with it being disseminated in that way? Now, what are the risks in the case of non-compliance? The first one is downtime. If you have a breach, you obviously have the incident response. And if from there it's found that you are violating the regulations, it's bound to lead to a further investigation, extended downtime, loss of revenue. There is a potential harm to reputation, although arguably in recent times or high profile cases, the loss of mark. Uh, the loss of business from these uh, breaches has been relatively minimal or short-lived. And of course, as mentioned before, the fines up to 4%, up to 4% of annual revenue per infraction. This means if you're disseminating data to three parties, that's 12%, not just four. Something good to, when trying to talk with higher level management. Obviously, security and compliance are not the same. One does not imply the other, but a good security strategy will be limiting how your data is leaving, providing some compliance and limiting access to your data from third parties. Likewise, a good compliance strategy will be limiting how long you're keeping data for, limiting your exposure, providing you on the same hand with some better security posture. So, who am I? I'm Juan. I worked for close to three years in IT for hospitality. During that time, we had the GDPR Go Live, and I was uh, involved with implementing the corporate strategy, developing our own uh, procedures across all departments, doing the risk analysis for all departments where we found the key for us was HR for all things with employee data and marketing for all things client facing. If you're coming from a different industry, different business case, it's highly likely that operations were gonna take a much higher priority in you. So with no further ado, I'm going to start with the strategies for failure with a little tale. Hansel and Gretel and the Forest of Compliance. Once upon a time, there was Gretel. Gretel was the CEO of Megacorp. She built this company from the ground up, putting in her blood, sweat, and tears into it. 
and uh, Megacorp is a big seller of goods and services across the world. As part of her weekly routine, Rettel would cross the plains to get to Europe. She would get the orders, come back to Megacorp, and make sure that the delivery process was went smoothly. This happened for many years until one day in 2018, as she was heading off to collect the orders from Europe, she was faced with this forest. The forest seemed dangerous and all she, all she could see around it was a little sign that said, if you can protect the data, you can cross the forest safely. Gretel thought nothing of it. I can just uh, walk right in and it's gonna be fine. Gretel looked around, found a little path, walked uh, through the forest for a couple hours, but slowly the path got smaller and smaller until suddenly it was just uh, the space between two trees and not a path anymore. She tried to turn back to head back to Megacorp, but she'd hit a dead end and couldn't leave the forest. Obviously, as with any regulation, any standard, if you're trying to be above board, you can't go at it with no strategy. You need to think about what you have to do or what's required of you, and then you have the ability to go on. Because of course, I'm a benevolent narrator, we get to bring Gretel back to the start of the forest. Gretel remembers that she can't just go into the forest and uh, come out the other side unscathed. The pain or trauma from this experience makes her rethink her choices. Gretel decides to head back to Megacorp and comes back the next day. The forest is still there. Gretel decides one more day of waiting, one more week. She no longer has any orders from Europe, which means she's also no longer delivering there. She starts getting phone calls from suppliers telling her that due to the loss of business, they're having to lay people off. Gretel feels a little bit responsible for this, but she's not ready to face the forest again alone. Slowly, as the businesses uh, have to lay more and more people out of work, what used to be a prosperous land becomes a barren wasteland. Of course, it's very difficult to, or rather, it's very easy to decide to not work with Europe. However, that's a strategy that's rather difficult to explain to a higher level management, especially if you're not working in news. Anything to do with goods and services, of course, they're going to be wanting to target one of the largest markets in the world. So once more, because we are benevolent, we let Gretel try once again. Gretel knows she can cross into the forest, but she also knows she can't go just anywhere. She decides she's going to try to get some help inside the forest. After all, forests are living things. She walks slowly, carefully, trying to look out for sounds, and hears a little laughter from underneath a, from underneath a mushroom. She looks closer and meets Sophie. Sophie comes from the forest and tells Gretel, hey, I can protect you. All you need to do is give me your contracts. I'll take a look over them and give you a paper to help get you out. Gretel thinks this is great because she's a respected businesswoman. She always has a copy of her contracts on her. So she gives these to Sophie. Sophie takes a look through the contracts, makes some remarks, gives them back to Gretel, along with a paper showing Gretel the way out. Gretel takes these and is on her way. Once again, she's able to get a little bit further into the forest, but once more, she starts noticing that the trees around her seem to be closing in and she's not able to see the edge of the forest anymore. 
until at one point she finds that she's completely locked in by the trees. Unsure of what happened because, of course, she was being protected by Sophie. Except Sophie didn't really care about Gretel's business. She was only protecting her from other parties, but not from herself. If you get a lawyer involved in as part of your strategy, it's very important to make sure that they're not only looking at how your vendors or partners manage your data. This is one element of the threat vectors or existing uh, risks to compliance, but it is not the end all solution for it. We bring Gretel then back to the start of her path. She knows she has to cross the forest because otherwise all of her countrymen and women are going to end up in the barren wasteland. She can't go at it blindfolded or it's going to end up in a mess. And she can't trust the help from inside the forest. She needs help before. Gretel decides to contact a lawyer beforehand, someone to check over her operations. After all, if uh, Sophie was able to protect her for a bit inside the forest, maybe she can get some protection from before the forest and with that be able to cross to the other side. The lawyer comes on site, checks her things, provides Gretel with a checklist with which Gretel quickly files, as well as a paper stating that the operations were checked. Gretel heads off into the forest, confident this time that she's going to be able to get to the other side. As you can imagine, once more, she hits the dead end. It's very easy to have audits done on businesses, operations and relations with other parties. If nothing is done about these audits, it's the same as having a penetration test every year for PCI, storing it and not doing anything about it. You're not becoming compliant. You have simply created a checklist of things to do, which you are not doing. And the audit is not part of the compliance. It's actually executing those tasks, which is. Gretel is now tired of getting lost in the forest. She remembers that no matter what she does, no one seems to be able to get her across to, to the other side. So she calls on her brother, Hansel. Hansel has been managing IT for her company ever since they went digital. Unfortunately, Hansel is highly understaffed, which has led to them having a couple issues of burnout. But Hansel has been able to overcome most challenges through his extensive network of IT professionals. Hansel decides he's not going to brute force his way through the forest. Instead, he's going to contact one of his friends. Jack tells him, yeah, we worked with um, this woman, Rapunzel. She sold us some diamonds and um, we we're able to get across to the other end of the forest. So Hansel sets up the meeting. Rapunzel shows him the diamond and tells him, this diamond will protect you to the other end of the forest. Look at all this list of high name clients that we have. They've all purchased our diamonds and they're getting to the other side of the forest. And so thinks this is great. This is the ultimate weapon to, or the ultimate tool to get to the other side. So Hansel heads off into the forest alone. And as he's, as he's nearing the edge of the forest, he hears a noise just to his left. He thinks, okay, I can leave the forest and be in Europe or I can just quickly look at what that noise is. So he gets closer to the forest, uh, to the source of the noise. And he sees a very tall tower. Okay, so this is the source of the noise. But what he sees in the tower impacts him even more, where there's a door frame which should hold a door, but 
it's just the door frame. He thinks this is very odd, and he sees lots of gremlins going in and out holding papers. He wonders what's going on here, so he gets closer to the tower and asks one of the gremlins what's going on. The gremlin hands him one of the pieces of paper, and Hansel sees his company's details all over it. The edge of the forest, which seemed so close, now seems so far away. He finds himself unable to leave from this tower because, of course, he's been putting all of his data off premise with someone who was selling him a shiny diamond. If any company tries to sell you uh, the end all be all tool of for compliance, 99% of the time, what they're selling you is a customer relationship manager. They're going to be rebuilding your databases off site where you have no more control over them. And because of the way responsibilities are managed with regards of who is supposed to own the data and who's processing it, if they get breached, they can claim that it's your fault for handing them the data. And likewise, if you get breached and it's found that you were giving them this data, you're of course not much better off. Hansel, not wanting to be beaten in such a way, takes his memory and decides to call upon his heads of department. He has the donkey who is in charge of, well, all the automated tasks, the cat who provides support but is really mean with clients, the dog who the clients love, and the rooster that just makes sure everything runs smoothly. He talks to the four animals and says, hey, we need to cross the, the forest, but we need to protect our customers' data. And no matter what we do, we seem to having to start all over again. They talk it through and realize that all of them are affected by it differently. The donkey who's primarily accessing data for automated tasks says he only needs to be aware of the risks when he's accessing this data. The cat who's working with uh, the ERP, the CRM and various monitoring tools needs to inform his subordinates about the risks involved in the data how not to move it or keeping it in uh, company infrastructure, and of course, training them in the behavior with using the CRP CRM to ensure compliance. The dog who takes orders from clients, working the data entry, all the importance on the behavior and how he's gonna be taking notes for this, either directly entering it to the ERP or CRM, rather than post-its around it because of the risks involved for his clients. The dog subordinates who are directly facing the clients, those at the front of the house, as we say, they need to be aware of the company policies with the data protection. How does this link to their behavior and the security? Not only security for the data, but also the risks to the company if they don't comply to these policies, as well as the risks to themselves, depending on how they're communicating with the other um, clients. Finally, the rooster, this high management person, animal, understands that as a high value target, his behavior is critical to ensure compliance across the board. Not only is he more at risk than the others to be targeted, but policies affect him even more, not less. Armed with this strategy, the team heads off into the forest. Whether or not they make it to the other side is left to the viewers for decision. I'd like to leave you with a little poem. It's not PII, it can be PII, it was PII. 
thank you. And I'm still around if anyone has questions. I'd like to thank Karel, who was my mentor for the con, Zoe Rose, who went through the slides, and Sam Humphreys, who also helped me a lot with the GDPR elements. No, I appreciate it, Juan. This is very interesting because I know this is something that we deal with on a daily basis, GDPR, everything. I also found this is it's a very good way to really get everybody in the organization attention. You know, if you can link any of your findings or um, exploits back to <clears throat> GDPR, um, any type of regulations, people eyes perk up and, you know, it's like, hey, well, what do you say? You know, they, they, they understand those calls. So, no, absolutely very good information. I do, uh, on a complete side note for the actual content, I am always uh, impressed with intentionally choosing slides with, you know, a handful of words at most or zero and going through the story time nonetheless. So uh, regardless of the actual content, which itself was awesome, let me uh, highlight the, the top tier speaking capability that, that you demonstrated there. Uh, so very nicely done. Uh, so comment from the uh, Discord coming in. Great talk. Help break this complex topic into consumable pieces. This is continue with that theme, right? Make the complex simple. Make the complex understandable. Even if it is a complicated thing, uh, I know you had the very early slide of you have the right to be forgotten. You have the right to privacy. Like there are GDPR. I don't know how long the text of it itself is, but I think it's safe to say at least hundreds of pages, if not thousands, to <laughs> be full actual text. But the the one sentence description of the right to be forgotten, like what? But that describes so much so quickly. So you start off with big picture and work into more complex as necessary. You made things relatable via stories. So and, and you ended with a haiku. So I mean, how much more awesome could it be? So I, I'm. You done good. Thank you. Thank you guys. <laughs> uh, let's see. Yep, we got uh, Nathan up next. Nathan uh, Chung. Uh, it's a pre recorded talk on neurodiversity in cybersecurity. Um, Leslie or Juan, any parting thoughts before we move into uh, next presentation coming up? We're doing fine for time. We have a couple more minutes if you need it. Oh, no, Juan, it was great, man. You, you've you surpassed, like, like Jeff, like Jeff said, you surpassed the level of just talking points and everything. And honestly, this is something like that's, it's always being interpreted different ways. So I, I, I take my hat up to you to take a complex topic like GDPR, especially when you have a bunch of lawyers working around it and bringing it down to something like, okay, you can use it more of like an awareness thing. Like, hey, this is what it is per se. So hats off to you. I, I love it. I'm, I'm a big fan of the phrase mental model, building out your your understanding of how something works. You can get into, the, of course, the nitty and gritty later on, but building out your mental model of like, this is what GDPR is in a, a couple sentences or a couple paragraphs and be able to understand that and relay it to others, that helps things spread. I like to build up my mental model of a lot of areas, even though there's a lot of things that I don't examine further and further depth, that's okay. If I understand what kind of the, the basics are of that area, that's being like IT generalist, right? Sysadmin work started off with a lot of generalists and you dive deep into areas as need be, but you'll understand the, the overall scenario. That's why I'm completely biased. I think sysadmin work is a great segue to a lot of fields within IT. Uh, help desk, very similar situation. Network yeah. admin, very similar situation. You just, you get a big breadth of experience before diving into something that really interests you for the one niche or you stay a generalist which is fine as well um okay uh with that being said uh, again thank you one